Today we're going to take a look at dynamic stability. Last week we looked at static stability for both lateral and um, longitudinal modes, but as we saw at the beginning, one can be statically stable and still be dynamically unstable. So we'll need to take a closer look at dynamic stability today. I'll take a second here and share my screen. Okay. So uh, let's review a little bit um, and talk about eigenvalues. You've seen these before in our dynamics class. I just wanna give a little bit of review. So remember with eigenvalues, we can have a real eigenvalue or we can have a complex eigenvalue. Complex eigenvalue will have a real, an imaginary part. We can write it this way. Um, this is the real part and then these are often the symbols we use. And I'm gonna use I, sometimes you might use J. All right, this would be the imaginary part. So this is the real part, this is the imaginary part, and this might be zero, right? So it might only be a real root. We often like to plot these on the complex plane. Um, oops. So that would mean that the, the x-axis here is gonna be the real part of my eigenvalue, and the y-axis is the imaginary part. <clears throat> So if we have a complex value, these always occur as a complex conjugate, meaning we have the plus and the minus. So that means that they might look something like this, right? The plus or minus is gonna mirror it around that y-axis. The real part is the same for both, just a plus and minus on that imaginary part. Um, this distance here, of course, is sigma, right? Um, and this is WD by the way we've defined it. This distance here is often called the natural frequency or the undamped natural frequency, omega n. And then this angle here is related to the damping ratio, zeta. Um, that's, uh, yeah, so you, you've probably heard these things. We're not gonna get worried too much about the uh, nomenclature here, but what we do wanna review and what I wanna ask you is a few questions of you think about them. Um, so first, uh, what does it mean if my eigenvalues are on the left half plane versus the right half plane? What about if they are on the real axis versus away from the axis? Or what if they are close to the imaginary axis or far away from the imaginary axis? So let's think about those three things again. Um, actually, let's just do the, yeah, those three. Left plane versus right plane, what does that mean? If I'm close or far away from the real axis or close or far away from the imaginary axis. Just take a second and think about those things. Okay, so uh, our view, remember the um, real part here tells me something about uh, my damping. I mean, really this angle here is what we define as a damping ratio. But as this becomes further away, and if this is negative, I remember these get these eigenvalues, we can think of them as, uh, as exponentials or cosines and sines, you know, they're, they're complex exponentials or, or cosines and sines. Basically, this frequency is going to relate to oscillation and the real part is gonna relate more to the damping. So <clears throat> everything on the left half plane, you may remember, is stable. It has a negative component for this real, uh, or negative sign for the real component of my eigenvalue. That means it's going to decay. Eventually it'll get to zero. It may be a slow decay, but it will get there eventually. Whereas if this is a positive value, that means uh, that mode is gonna be increasing. It's unstable. Some uh, disturbance is going to increase in magnitude. Okay, so that's the left versus right. And similarly then we can see that if it's a little to the left versus a lot to the left. Right? A little to the left is gonna be a little bit of, of damping, whereas a lot to the left is gonna be a much stronger damping. So <clears throat> as we get closer to this axis, I guess closer to a neutral stability where we're on the border between stable and unstable. Imaginary axis, this is related more to our frequency. So if I had no imaginary component, if this was zero, that means it's purely real. I may have a, an eigenvalue or two eigenvalues on the real axis. Um, if there's no imaginary component, that means there's no oscillation, right? It's just going to either decay or blow up, but there's no oscillation to it. And of course, the farther I get away then, 
that means those oscillations are going to increase in size, uh, or they're going to be, sorry, higher frequency. Um, this is a plot we saw a while ago, and we talked to kind of talk about the differences between uh, static and dynamic stability. We now can label these. Um, so take a minute to do that. For each plot here, write down what the eigenvalues are like. Describe them. Are they is the, what's the sign of the real part? Is it complex or does it not have a complex part? So pause and take a second to do that. Okay, so these on the left side, they have no oscillations, so we know that these are purely real. So this is real, this is real, there's no imaginary part, and this one is blowing up, right? So we know this is a positive, and this one is negative, it's stable. Okay, so again, remember negative is stable, the left half plane is stable right half plane unstable. You may, you may remember that rule um, that we wanted to get uh, all our dynamics onto the left half plane if we want them to be stable. Okay, so then these ones on the right, since they have a uh, oscillatory component, we know these are complex, meaning they have a real and an imaginary part. Um, the other thing that we know is because this one is decaying, that the real part is negative. Okay. Whereas on the top one, because it's uh, increasing, it's blowing up, then we could say the real part is positive. Okay, so these figures directly correspond to our eigenvalues. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to look at um, the eigenvalues for a typical aircraft. Most aircraft are going to have these same kind of eigenvalues, although sometimes you'll have some differences if you do something really, really different, but this is very common. Um, <clears throat> the first, we'll look at the longitudinal dynamics, right? This is our pitching direction. Uh, and what we see here are two complex conjugate pairs. This one on the left, we call it the short period mode. And this one that's close to the axis, we call fugoid mode. Okay, um, and we're going to look at some figures about what these look like. They're a little bit hard to visualize, but let's just look at them first. And what do you notice? based on what you see where they are, what do you expect the dynamics to look like? And I should say these are the open loop, dynam or open loop dynamics that we're looking at. Uh, we can, of course, modify these with the controller, but these are the general open loop dynamics. Okay, by looking at this, we'd expect short period to have a lot of damping, right? It's very stable, far over on the left half plane. Fugoid looks like it's really close to that axis, so not a lot of damping, um, not uh, even maybe even close to being unstable. <clears throat> and indeed, that's what we see. The short period mode is pretty uninteresting. It's highly damped. Um, this is a really exaggerated figure of what that might look like uh, in terms of the motion of the airplane. It occurs at basically constant airspeed. It's a constant airspeed mode, but there are changes in angle of attack. Right? The airplane changing angle of attack and altitude. So it might be a dip in altitude with an increase in angle of attack and then vice versa and settle back. Uh, but generally, the damping here is, is really high. That This is not really noticeable at all. <clears throat> and in fact, most pilots may not even know that it exists on the airplane. They may not feel that at all. <clears throat> this is really affected by the static margin. So because we designed for designing for stability, then this is going to have be a highly damped mode. Okay, so I linked to some videos. I'm not going to show them right now because actually I don't know if they're actually that helpful, but um, if you go look at some online, it's kind of hard to visualize these these uh, side plots are probably easier to see than, than some of these videos, but um, go ahead and take a look on YouTube or just search for uh, short period or some of these other modes if you want to try and get another view. Fugoid, remember that's the one that was lightly damped. Instead of having it at constant airspeed with changes in angle of attack and, and altitude, this one is at constant angle of attack. Um, but changes in airspeed and altitude. And you can think of it as kind of like a, a roller coaster, slow roller coaster. It's like you go up, you're getting potential energy, uh, slowing down in speed, and then you're coming down, speeding up, and then you just kind of repeat that motion, right? It's kind of, uh, uh, it's a very slow, uh, it's lightly damped. So this will generally, right, uh, decay eventually, but the damping is so low, it's going to take a long time. We call it the fugoid mode. We also call it sometimes the long period, I guess, to contrast from short period to long period, but more commonly it's called the fugoid mode. <clears throat> 
Um, so it's a very gradual, slow change um, in altitude and airspeed. It might even be slightly unstable, um, but because it's so slow, usually if you, if you have visual flight, uh, so, so there are two types of flight rules. Uh, as, as a pilot, you first get certified for VFR, visual flight rules. That means you can fly when, roughly speaking, when the conditions are, are clear, uh, when there's good visibility, you're not instrument rated yet, so you can only fly when it's good conditions. The next level would get IFR, instrument flight rated. That means you can fly with in bad visibility because you know how to use the instruments, um, so you can rely on instruments. If it's visual flight rules, right, you can see this, you can correct it very easily without noticing. Um, if there's bad visibility, then this can be a more challenging mode because it can be harder to detect. So um, it's nice to have some good stability here, even if it's only lightly damp. Okay, so those are the longitudinal modes. And now let's talk about the lateral modes. Here's the lateral modes. Notice, notice that we have one complex conjugate pair, so there's gonna be an oscillatory mode, but now we have two real modes. These ones are have no imaginary component, so no oscillation. Um, there's a roll mode, which has a really high damping, um, and then a spiral mode, which generally has very low damping and sometimes is even unstable. Okay, so the roll mode, let's look at that first. This one is really boring. It's highly damped. You generally won't even ever notice it. It just means that your roll rate over time, you know, you, you initiate a roll, uh, there's gonna, it's gonna um, converge towards some roll rate, but it's gonna do that really fast. And it's generally, it doesn't oscillate, right? It's a fully real mode. Uh, so not, not that interesting. This other mode though, spiral mode here on the right, uh, quite a bit more interesting potentially. This is generally lightly damped and potentially unstable. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, you can see why it's called spiral mode. It's very lightly damped. Um, it, uh, what happens is that you get, it's kind of a, uh, initiates a slow turn, right? So you start getting into this, uh, turn and a turn is going to have you, because you've turned, right? You've tilted your lift vector a little bit. That's what causes the turn. That means also that your lift is dropping a bit. So you maybe start dropping or your lift is reduced relative to the weight. So you might start descending a little bit. Um, this mode can be quite dangerous uh, in bad visibility. So again, in a visual flight rules, visibility is good. It's easy to notice that you've started to turn a bit and to correct that. Um, if it's uh, instrument flight rules, uh, this can be bad if you're not uh, uh, well trained or well prepared. It has led to some uh, catastrophic accidents in history. Because uh, what will happen is, well, as an example, you start to turn, okay, and you initiate this turn, but it's very gradual, lightly damp, very slow mode, you're starting to turn. Uh, your ears, the way they work, roughly, you know, I'm not a biologist here, but there's fluid, right, that moves through them and moves past, uh, I don't know what they are, but some sort of sensors in your ears, right, like think of it maybe as hairs that it moves past. Um, that It's these changes in motion that you detect as acceleration. It's kind of got like a linear an angular accelerometer, if you will. Um, but once you start turning, right, it starts to reach a new equilibrium and you're not detecting any change anymore. And so what can happen is, even though you're turning, you're accelerating inward, right, in a circle, you don't feel that anymore. It feels like you are stationary, that you are in, in level flight. And that can be quite dangerous because if you don't have a horizon to see, you're relying on instruments and you're not, uh, maybe, uh, used to them or you are worried that they're not um, functioning properly, uh, your, your senses can deceive you because you might turn right to correct it. But now because the motion has changed, your ear, your balance will feel like, oh, I'm accelerating, I'm turning. And so then you turn back and then you feel like you're level again, but then you're not, right? So it can be quite dangerous because you're in the slow turn. It's not the slow turn that's dangerous though, it's that you stay in it, that's the problem. As you stay in it, you feel like, okay, things are, are fine, you know, I feel like I'm level because it's gradual, but that turn, because you've tilted that left lift vector, you get less lift, you're starting to descend a little bit, and these turns start increasing slowly. You start getting sharper and sharper turns, um, and pretty soon, you know, you enter, it's called the graveyard spiral. The spiral gets too tight, and then you're descending too quickly, and the other problem here, though, is because you will start to feel that descent, 
that you might pull up on the stick, right? Uh, you say stick, but it depends what you're flying. We still might call it a stick. You pull up um, because you're trying to increase your lift, but because you're turning, increasing that lift, it is going to increase that vertical component, but it also increases that horizontal component because the lift vector is tilted. So you're going to accelerate sideways more. You're going to turn even steeper. So pulling up to correct that lift actually makes the spiral tighter. And then you enter a dive and, and there's been some fatal accidents that way. So uh, really important, uh, you know, this can be important for the design of the aircraft and of course important uh, to test and to train on instruments if you're going to be flying in such things. Uh, for your airplanes, it's it's a good mode to be stable on. Um, because it's piloted and you have good visibility, it's easy to correct for. But if you're just doing a glide, for example, uh, you don't want a unstable spiral mode generally. OK, and then the last one, Dutch roll. Uh, this is the one, if we go back, it has a complex conjugate pair. So there's some oscillation involved here. Um, so it's it's like a coupling. I, I kind of think of it like as a skiing motion. Maybe you're like coming up on these banks, and there's like this coupling between your yawing and rolling. Um, it's not so much a danger like the uh, spiral mode is, but it can be very unsettling to passengers. Right for a passenger plane, you want this to be uh, high, uh, much more uh, have sufficient damping because this kind of motion it happens pretty quickly. Like I'm drawing it around moving it kind of slowly like I'm skiing, but it can be a very kind of quick thing. And that doesn't, uh, yeah, it's, it's unsettling, right? And so it sometimes can be very noticeable depending on the plane you're flying on. Um, you can look, there's some good videos. The best video I've ever seen isn't publicly available, unfortunately. Uh, it's the kind of thing that an aircraft company doesn't always want to show because they're exciting that mode intentionally with the worst case loading. Uh, which is great to see as an engineer, but you know, passenger doesn't want to see that that kind of motion can happen. Um, but this is something that you want to design for uh, with enough critical damping so that you don't, um, especially for pilot airplanes, you know, your passengers are are still happy. All right, so that's it. Uh, as a quick introduction to the main dynamic modes uh, for an aircraft and. Uh, if you're, uh, as you're using XFlyer, you'll be able to see these. You can plot them on the complex plane and you can see how stable you are if you're getting them over to the left half plane. Uh, so this will be a, an important criteria to look at in addition to your static stability, um, especially with um, gliding or with uh, less experienced piloting. You want to get things that have nice stability that's with a, that you can, you know, uh, fly well. All right. Uh, we'll see you next time.